It's always something different to do. So it's not boring. Now on Chronicle, when the sun goes down over Pittsburgh, the steel city is still wide awake. Come in here because it stays open so late or the pizza's that good? Both. Both. Meet the Pittsburghers working all night long to get you ready for the morning. It's not for everybody, but we're all night guys and night girls here, you know, the whole crew. The paramedics responding to late night emergencies. Could be you're going from, you're chasing call after call, where you're leaving, you know, the hospital and going to another call. And those working to get strong after hours. There's definitely a, a vibe to being a night owl in the gym. Experience our city's moonlit traditions. It's kind of like a mecca for people. People never forget the driving. And find out how to see Pittsburgh in a whole new light. It's cool. I mean, you definitely get to see everything. Yeah. The city's beautiful at night. This is Chronicle, Pittsburgh after dark. Welcome to Chronicle, I'm Janelle Hall. And I'm Ryan Recker. During the next hour, we're gonna take a look at the side of Pittsburgh you don't normally see when the sun goes down and the moon comes up. That's right, this look at Pittsburgh after dark has really been a labor of love for the team here at Chronicle. Our work began more than four years ago, but had to take a break during the COVID-19 pandemic that transformed not just our city, but the entire world. And many of our stories are going to look at the impact of the pandemic on those who work and have fun after hours here in the Steel City. We want to start with a rare behind the scenes look here in the City of Champions. It's the transformation of PPG Paints Arena during the quick change from basketball to hockey. As the final horn sounds at PPG Paints Arena, fans head for the exits. Players and coaches head for the locker rooms as the night is over. That is, except for a small group of others whose night yeah. and work is just beginning. It's just after 9 p.m. And the mission on this particular night is to transition from a basketball court to a hockey rink for a 1 p.m. Penguins game the following day. The ice have to be ready by 7.30, 8 o'clock. Time is ticking for a team of around 20 people. They're like any, uh, any sports team. Uh, 20 folks have to work together. They have to uh, get along. Um, so where there's one person leading the crew, he's got two or three captains underneath him, and then everybody has an assigned job for that time period that they're doing. So they do have to work as a team. It's very much like the Penguins itself. And there's no magic here and no slick technology, just good old fashioned labor using hands and tools. It's always something different to do. So it's not boring. The breakdown of the basketball setup begins with the removal of chairs from the floor. Let me loosen mine first, pull on it. All right. Hoops are disassembled and the floor itself is lifted in pieces and eventually transported and stored away in the bows of the arena. As that is happening, Seating sections are being torn down. But start taking rails off, sticking them underneath, get everything prepped. Tell Jake, man, go take that rail out. Go take the rail out and take the step out so we can back that up and drop them seats. Front row seats for basketball become the hockey penalty box, and portions of the dasher boards are replaced. The work is quick, but with tremendous attention to detail. And by their standards, this is actually a light changeover. Now at midnight, things are running rather smoothly. We're way ahead of schedule. With seven hours until their deadline comes one of the more involved aspects of this process, installing and securing the glass. Each panel weighs in at around 500 pounds. And now in the wee hours of the morning and with tiredness setting in, yet another big project removing the covering of the ice. Hey, John, leave it over this way a little bit. 480 separate pieces lifted, loaded, and driven out on eight separate carts. People are surprised that we can do it so quickly. Just after 6 a.m., the path is clear for the Zamboni to put a punctuation mark on the process. That's the bottom line. No matter what, we always got it done. If we end up on TV, something has gone wrong and we don't want that to happen. So we like to do everything in the dark, outside of people's view. On this occasion, this skilled and savvy team did end up on television and for good reason. And until next time, 
their work is done. We don't like to get noticed. Everything we do happens when nobody's in the building. So when we get 18,000 people in the seats, we get to sit back and breathe for three hours. As day turns tonight, the TSA lines, terminals and tarmacs at Pittsburgh International Airport empty out. But just because there are no passengers doesn't mean all is quiet. Dozens of workers are inside preparing the airport for the next day, and their jobs are so important. They could affect thousands of people if not done correctly. Sheldon Ingram takes us inside the after dark happenings. Three hundred twenty flights take off and land at Pittsburgh International every day. Aircraft streaking down runways at 175 miles an hour. More than 9 million passengers used the airport last year. It's the busiest public facility in Allegheny County. Thousands of pieces of luggage come and go. All of this activity on the runways inside the terminal. It's the normal vibe typically seen in the airport. But something else happens overnight when the airport shuts down. Something the public never sees. It's getting this place ready for the next day. Airport operations is the nerve center. Night stalkers assigned to surveillance inside the terminal and on the runways, Mark Baranofsky is the operation night shift manager. This is our airport with the four runways, and we can see all the aircraft moving on the runways. This is where we are right now, the center core. These are active? These aircraft. are active aircraft moving on the ramp. This is a vehicle. Team members monitor every inch of the airport. They alert the FAA of runway problems that are a threat to incoming red-eye flights. They monitor all sorts of movement inside each concourse. It controls uh, all the security doors in the airport. So anytime we get an alarm on one of those doors, we send the police. Pit ground, pit ops two. Ops two pit. South ramp whiskey, like to inspect runway one zero right. A visual airfield inspection covering several thousand runway lights. It takes three hours each night. And, and what are you looking for? Looking for any outages, uh, broken globes, maybe missing fixtures. At the same time, over in the hangars, American Airlines engineers and mechanics get busy. They tear apart aircraft and put them back together, kind of like a hospital operating room. American operates the most flights at Pittsburgh International. This is also where they conduct routine maintenance and base inspections, anywhere from six to 12 aircraft. Bill Doffner is the maintenance manager. It's so critical that we need to have our aircrafts on the gate and airworthy ready in the mornings. How that happens could be as simple as a tire or brake change, or as complex as stripping down this aircraft to its core. It's back in the air with passengers in just 35 days. It's something the public never sees until now. We open up all the panels, we take out the seats, we take out the galleys, we take out the carpets, we take out the sidewalls. Everything's open for inspection as far as from nose to tail. And then the test run. We go outside and we do engine runs, uh, furbish the oil, check the oil, make sure all the fluids and the hydraulics are good. And so you do all of this in 35 days? We do all of this in 35 days. This overnight operation is the reason passengers are reunited with their luggage in a timely manner. In the belly of Pittsburgh International, as the terminal sleeps, underneath the baggage system, this is eight miles of moving baggage belts. The average passenger coming through the airport on a daily basis, they have no idea what you guys are up to at night. No, uh -uh. no, they, they don't see behind the scenes. Ryan Sedgmer leads a 16 man crew. On this night, they're fixing a drive roller, which moves the belts that carry the luggage. We have to make sure they maintain that. We have to make sure they're ready to go by the time the ticket counters open up in the morning. Rebuilding motors and gears in a luggage system. Anywhere from four. Uh... Rehabilitating aircraft. And we can uh, pick up any camera in the airport. Surveillance inside the terminal. Inspecting runways. Pittsburgh after dark.
It's always happening at Pittsburgh International. We all know Pittsburgh's tunnels are synonymous with traffic. The miles long wait during rush hour. After dark though, traffic just sails through the tunnel, but for one small group, that's when things are just getting started. For what we do with all three tunnels, it's important. From the Fort Pitt to the Squirrel Hill and Liberty Tunnel. It's a 24 hour operation, 365 days a year. Come along as we follow the overnight crews who help keep the main tunnels connecting the suburbs to the city open and operating every day and night. I start my shift at 930, working on the roads. It is a little bit scarier at night. In part due to distracted drivers in the dark. Try to be as safe as possible at all times. That's our number one concern for us and the public. Working inside a tunnel um, has its own unique set of challenges. We aren't able to have an escape route. Uh, there are walls all around us. So it's very important that we're able to work safely in these works in these work zones by protecting ourselves with crash trucks, cones, appropriate signing. But we also rely tremendously on the motorists to slow down in, through our work zones. Working right next to the moving traffic can really be a challenge for crews, especially when they have to close one lane of traffic to get their work done during the quieter overnight hours. Maintaining safe traffic flow through the tunnels at all times. Um, assisting state police, other emergency responders. Um, we do have routine maintenance that we do in the tunnels and around the tunnels. Um, but at any given time, you know, things, serious situations can happen in and in, around a tunnel too, and we, we're there to help. Two crews work specifically at night, one to keep the tunnel clean, the other to make sure the tunnels are lit well for drivers. That's what they're like whenever they're closed. The electricians are responsible for uh, maintenance and repair of our fan systems, uh, fire alarm systems, uh, relighting the tunnels when bulbs go out, things like that. Maintaining the right light level inside the tunnel is important so that it affects the driver's eyes less. Um, if it's too dark in the tunnel, motorists tend to slow down. So we want to maintain that right light level for them. On this midnight shift, sometimes these workers see some unusual things. Craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, probably I uh, saw a guy walking down the middle of the parkway approaching Fort Pitt Tunnel not wearing any clothes. Um, he then was subsequently arrested by the state police. We never know really what we're walking into. You never One benefit to working the overnight hours on the busiest roads in and out of downtown Pittsburgh, the commute. No traffic coming in, no traffic going home. And the flexibility this shift affords when it comes to family time. My kids love it. Uh, I go home at about 5.30, 6 in the morning go to sleep and uh, my wife and kids go and start their day. And um, when they get home, I'm up and I'm waiting for them to get home. And uh, my wife loves it. I have dinner cooking and kids love it. I'm there to help them with their schoolwork. Providing for their families while also providing a service to the public while reminding people to please keep their safety in mind. We just appreciate people paying attention, slowing down in the work zones. Uh, when you see the yellow lights or, or cones and patterns in, in and around the tunnels, just slow down. and. Next on Chronicle. It is immense pressure and we take it seriously. School district leaders working overnight to make sure your children get to class safely in the morning or not at all. I listen to the recommendations that the, the police and the road crews give me. The work that goes into calling a school delay or cancellation and why it all happens after dark. And before we go to break, another way to experience Pittsburgh after dark. The city is beautiful at night. Chronicle taking a ride on the Duquesne Incline. This is my first <laughs> time, even though I'm I'm from Pittsburgh. I don't know why I've never yeah. done it before. The Incline operates into the very late evening. It's Ooh, everybody state. And the consensus during our ride is it's a unique way to see the city after the sun goes down. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, you definitely get to see everything. Cool yeah. The city's beautiful at night. Chronicle, Pittsburgh after dark continues after this. To delay or not to delay, that is the question. And during winter weather, it is something that students, parents, and school leaders are thinking about even in the overnight hours. And the decision to delay or cancel school doesn't come lightly and sometimes has to be made when most people are sleeping. It is immense pressure and we take it seriously. When it comes to school closings or delays, long before you get an alert here in Baldwin Whitehall or any other school district. Yeah, I watch the weather the evening before uh, the reports to see if it's going to be icy conditions or if it's uh, they're calling for snow. He's my eyes and ears 
that are out there that, that, out on the road. It's a team effort before a superintendent makes that final call. And I'll get up around maybe 245. It is a grind, but this time of the winter, um, normally superintendents around the county are just exhausted. And say we do hit a bad side street out there. Before his retirement, the transportation director for the Baldwin Whitehall School District gave us a glimpse of his overnight safety routine. I listen to the recommendations that uh, the police and the road crews give me. All while personally driving the bus routes to see if he should suggest a snow day for his district in the South Hills. If I see those side streets are slippery and it's getting close, if we feel it's uh, not safe, then I tell the superintendent, I feel we should be, you have a two hour delay. Sometimes it is follow the leader because you know, no one wants to be the lone wolf on these, these things because if you, if you are too um, aggressive and you want to try to have school, it's not worth the safety of one child. Maybe roads are in good conditions, but you know, sidewalks might be icy, driveways might be icy. Um, even though if the road crews are out throwing salt, um, if, folk, if the kids can't get to the bus stop because of, of sidewalks and so forth, you have to take that into consideration. One accident, one kid to get hurt, and that's too many, so we, we don't risk it. So we just know that with, with Pittsburgh weathers, um, it can be very different conditions in, in a very close proximity. 22 miles away in Jeanette, Westmoreland County. We typically would, would connect with the, the superintendents that are very close to us, Penn Trafford, Norwin, Franklin Regional, uh, Hemfield area, some of those that are, that are right around us. Um, and then if you go to the north part of the county, uh, New Kensington Borough, they could have completely different weather than we can have just 30 miles away. Uh, to the east, uh, Ligonier, Derry, Latrobe on that ridge, uh, again, completely different weather than we may have right here. So it is important that we connect, uh, we try to share information. Instead of canceling school in this post-pandemic era, Many superintendents now make the call overnight to move to a flexible instruction day so they don't have to interrupt instruction or make up that time on a break or in the summer. And it, it's afforded us the opportunity not to use snow days to ensure that students are getting a quality education even though they can't be in front of a teacher in, in the traditional classroom setting. As long as the students have their iPads or computers to ensure every child has access to a virtual class. For instance, in our district, uh, most of our kids have devices, but some don't. Some students don't take devices home. So it's, it's really giving the parents and the families uh, 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 some notice. Next on Chronicle. It's steadily growing. There's multiple people teaching it, putting on events throughout the city. Feeling the groove after dark. It's really good for your brain. It's good for your body. The late night excitement drawing young people to Pittsburgh after the sun goes down. We've already talked about some of the people working overnight, but what about the fun? Like the Pittsburghers hitting the nightclubs and the bars looking for a good time. And as Sheldon Ingram shows us, there is a lot of nightlife right here in the Steel City. It's after midnight in Pittsburgh neighborhoods. Most people are asleep, but when their lights go out, it's Combo in the Strip District. It's Foxtail on Carson Street, two of Pittsburgh's premier nightclubs, two high-octane venues, bullish on booming bass, hyped-up DJs, gyrating dancers, penetrating light displays, and dance floors packed with patrons, seduced by the energy they feel only after midnight. But wait, there's another kind of vibe to Pittsburgh's nightlife. Salsa. Pittsburgh's Latin dance scene has held a prominent place in Pittsburgh's nightlife for the past 25 years. Crossbody Dance and Movement on Wood Street downtown is one of the dedicated weekly dance venues. Rachel Booth is a dancer and the owner of Crossbody Dance and Movement. It's really good for your brain. It's good for your body. I used to be a runner. I don't run anymore. <laughs> I just do this. It's it's so much fun. Jeff and Colleen Shirey cultivate the Pittsburgh Latin dance scene through Salsa Pittsburgh. It's a website with every venue, dance instructor, and event. It's steadily growing. There's multiple people teaching it, putting on events throughout the city. Even Cabo offers Latin music on weekends to go with its traditional nightclub entertainment. A room and dance floor totally dedicated to salsa, merengue, and bachata. 
But Pittsburgh After Dark also captures a more laid back form of nightlife, cigar bars. This one is called Blend, located downtown. The staff calls it high end, with a luxurious atmosphere, soothing music, a Frank Sinatra feel, a diverse offering of more than 20 cigar brands from around the world. That flavorful smoke is complemented with a robust selection of bourbon and whiskey. And then the speakeasies. In these places, conversation and tasty spirits are the priority. And if it's difficult to spot a speakeasy on the street, that's by design. We don't want people to see what we're doing on the street. Shane Morrison is the manager at Acacia Speakeasy on Carson Street. This building is about 120 years old with the original brick siding. It bears a nondescript appearance, a tribute to speakeasies during the Prohibition era. Why are they so popular in the United States and here in Pittsburgh? I, you know, honestly, I personally, I think people are looking for something different. I think they're looking for something that maybe it's a little elevated versus, you know, you're just your run-of-the-mill cocktails. That you... And their cocktails are unique, created by their staff. We try to stick to pre-prohibition era cocktail recipes, so we try to keep things as classic as we possibly can based off of what people way before us knew, so there's a bit of history behind everything, which makes it really interesting. That's the same idea behind Bitter End, a speakeasy in Edinburgh, another building more than 100 years old. It's a very rich history of Pittsburgh. It's a very rich history in Aetna specifically. And we try to tie a lot of the aura and a lot of the atmosphere um, and kind of tie it into that history. There's a lot of these places and speakeasies over the years, they're very connected to conversation and, and intimacy and having a good time. And it's also a good place to learn. Whatever your vibe, pulsating music, Latin rhythms, a cool smoke in an elegant setting, or the throwback field of speakeasies, it's all there in Pittsburgh after dark. Next on Chronicle. Motor vehicular accidents, far more than daylight. Uh, gunshot wounds, stabbings, much more than daylight. Answering the call when emergencies happen overnight. Absolutely, we have to be prepared. You absolutely have to be prepared for anything. The paramedics who jump into action on a moment's notice. Plus, getting strong after the sun goes down. Quite frankly, I like to be here when the conversation is nil and uh, when it's just me and uh, and me and the weights. The people seeing fitness in a whole new light after dark. Police, paramedics, and other emergency responders work 24 hours a day to be there when you need help. Sheldon Ingham straps in for a ride with some paramedics to find out what they experience in a night on the streets of Pittsburgh. Saturday night. A full moon over the city. A visual cue that something is about to happen in Pittsburgh after dark. Not a from home, but... When nighttime covers the city, few people stay as busy as the people with the Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services, the paramedics. Even a slow night offers action. On busy nights, they respond to everything from medical calls to shootings. Here, Medic 3 in the West End attends to a Pittsburgh Regional Transit passenger. You're chasing call after call where you're leaving you know, the hospital and going to another call. More so fights and violence because you know, as later in the night more people drink. It all depends on what's going on around the city. And Homewood. Tonight, Medic 1 in Homewood is rushing to a call at North Homewood Avenue and Bennett Street. When they arrive, it's an elderly woman laying in the street after she was struck by a car. Okay, okay, take some deep breaths. She was crossing the street with the aid of her walker, but police say the driver is nowhere to be found. It's a hit and run. Oh my God, help me, Jesus. Medic One is off to the hospital with the patient who is obviously in severe pain. We gotta keep that on, we gotta keep that on because that's helping stabilize your, your hip. You, we can't have you turn. We need to have you on your back, okay? So our first priority is, is figuring out if she's stable or unstable. So that what that looks like is checking her vitals, looking at what her heart rate is, what her blood pressure is doing. It's another Saturday night at Allegheny General Hospital. A patient is flown in as the hour pushes deep into the night. 
emergency and trauma staff brace themselves for what comes next. We get a lot more of the local um, violence. We get fights, shootings, stabbings that come more prominently after dark than during the daylight hours. They see the aftermath of violence under the cover of darkness. Victims brought here to the AGH level one trauma unit. Motor vehicular accidents far more than daylight. Uh, gunshot wounds, stabbings, much more than daylight. Kathy Sikora is the director of emergency services at Allegheny General Hospital. How do you assemble your team? So the team assembles as soon as the trauma alert goes off. A lot of times there's an estimated time of arrival associated with that, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour. ER lifeline. Yeah, go ahead. We put out a level two trauma for life flight. Two coming in from the scene, 37 female, roll over, motor vehicle accident. Tonight, flight coordinators for life flight work inside the hospital. They receive a 911 call about a bad accident. 21 year old MVC. They give that information to the trauma team. A badly injured patient is headed their way. Alert the ER that we have a helicopter that's on a scene. They're what's the injury complexes of the patient so that they can prepare for when the patient comes here. And at that point, the trauma team is on standby. That's exactly right, yes, absolutely. We have to be prepared. You absolutely have to be prepared for anything. Members of the trauma team prepared to treat a woman critically injured in a car accident in Clarion. Just moments later, Life Flight arrives with a badly injured woman. She is a mother who was driving with her daughter. Their vehicle was struck and landed in a creek upside down. And upside down into a stream where her daughter and her were trapped, partially submerged in water underneath the vehicle. Life like medics move fast from the flight deck down the hall to the trauma unit. A team of doctors and nurses already know the patient's name and have an idea of what injuries they have to treat. As many as a dozen people are working on this woman but everything is coordinated. We have machines like this one over here that we can rapidly give blood and fluids to a patient that will work to uh, help revive a patient potentially if they're losing a lot of blood uh, from a gunshot wound at the chest, for example. Uh, we're also at the same time evaluating their airway. If they're not breathing on their own. That everything is coordinated with all the people in here. Yes. Everything's coordinated. Everyone knows their role in here. And what's your role? I'm either at the bedside assisting with um, IVs or any interventions or I'll chart. Then we look at pulses, circulation, do they have all their pulses present? Now as you are going through this checklist, are you verbally communicating with the folks over yes. here with the person? Constantly. Tonight only one patient is under the care of the trauma team. Some nights they're working on multiple patients all at once. It could be a, a vehicle accident in Robinson. Uh, fight on the north side and a helicopter coming from another vehicle accident in Butler County and that could all happen in a matter of a uh, five minute time frame. Okay. First responders, trauma and emergency staff, they've seen it all and expect it all when nighttime falls over Pittsburgh. Nothing's normal, ever normal and at night usually everything has a story behind it. Getting strong after midnight. With 24-hour gyms becoming more popular, some folks are pumping iron at a time of day you might not expect. And for some off-hour gym goers, it all starts by looking at fitness from a different perspective. Definitely a, a vibe to being a night owl in the gym. Just because the sun has gone down doesn't mean you can't get in a good workout. The popularity of 24-7 gyms has been growing in recent years. Chronicle visits the Anytime Fitness in Hopewell Township to learn more about this trend. Some people are more like night owls and nocturnal, so if they work out late at night, they might sleep a little bit better. It works out really well because being a priest, my day is usually packed, so at night I have some free time, so it works out very well for my schedule. I do like working out at night. I come here a lot at night mostly because I work and have school during the day, so nights probably the best time for me to come here. Others say the smaller crowds in the nighttime and overnight hours are a benefit. Quite frankly, I like to be here when the conversation is nil and uh, when it's just me and, uh, and me and the weights. And that's not the only place where you can see people lifting weights when most of us are catching Z's. In early 2020, Chronicle caught up with Edwin Kors during his 1.30 a.m. workout at the Planet Fitness in Monroeville. It's peaceful. 
you know, not a lot of stuff going on, not distractions. Chronicle recently received an update from Coors, who confirms even though he's no longer a full-time Pittsburgher, his overnight workout philosophy is still the same. We sleep like probably one, one third of our life, our whole life, you know, so I try to get, get at least the most out of I can out of every other day or every day. And the gym goers in Hopewell add some other thoughts on why they choose to feel the burn in the dead of night. Very convenient because I don't have to worry about if they're going to be open or closed. I only live two minutes from here, so for me it's perfect because um, I can literally come anytime. I try to do everything off peak. I go grocery shopping off peak, I vacation off peak, I go to the gym off peak. I really like to uh, be by myself and uh, the times when you get to do that is uh, in the later hours. Discovering a hidden side of Pittsburgh even after the sun goes down. Walkers taking to the streets and trails and finding some unexpected spots after dark. These pathways around Pittsburgh offer a whole new perspective. You know, I think at night it has a whole different mystique. Look over here, you can see East Liberty. Nighttime hikes offer unexpected insights into Pittsburgh neighborhoods thanks to Venture Outdoors. Yeah, a blinking red light and just to the left of it. The trip leader is Mike Cornell. He loves history and hiking and now shares his passion with groups. The nice thing about scouting is when you go out with the intent to see th things that you haven't seen before, you end up noticing things that you may have gone by a hundred times and not noticed. And that's another thing about this series. People see the city from a different perspective. If you are walking across the Liberty Bridge, it's a totally different experience than when you're driving it at rush hour. You can look over the edge, you can enjoy the view, you're not focused on the car in front of you. Chronicle was out with one group back in 2020 when the route took 30 participants on a five mile hike around Oakland, which included an inside look at an unusually quiet cathedral of learning. Outside, it's mild. It's not always though. Well, <laughs> you see this bottle? 32 ounces and Mike remembers this. Uh, one night there was wind chill of minus 25 and uh, our hike took us across the Fort Pitt, the Fort Duquesne, uh, and the West End Bridge. This bottle was frozen solid halfway across the first bridge. That night had a minus 25 wind chill, yet the group kept going. Participants included those who were born and raised in Pittsburgh, new residents, and even out-of-towners. We're going into places that people have never seen before, up huge stairways and hills into, into places that are only accessible by foot sometimes. So. These hikes wouldn't be the same if we were doing them in the summer in the daylight. They're a little more mysterious this way. It just amazes me when you think you know your city, but you go through neighborhoods that you never, you had no idea were even out there. These are the roads less traveled, but might make all the difference in seeing Pittsburgh in a whole new light. Next on Chronicle, big screen nostalgia happening after dark. There's a lot of experiences you can't get in an indoor theater. You're not gonna cuddle up with a blanket, you're not going to see snow. Drive-ins battling through the pandemic. We had church services here Easter weekend for COVID. Um, a couple of high school graduations were, were held here. And how they're keeping a tradition alive in the overnight hours. And before we go to break, Pittsburgh truly is a city that never sleeps. And that's clear at the PRT East Liberty Garage, where the work continues overnight. Right now, uh, most of our scheduled services is done for the night. Uh, but buses are coming in, they're being washed. Uh, they'll be, uh, they'll come in through the wash racks, which are just over here. A careful process to get Pittsburgh's public transportation ready to be back on the road in the morning. Uh, they'll get the hose down, sprayed down, uh, wash with soap and water, and then rinse. Uh, they'll go onto the lift to have their engines cleaned and uh, sprayed down. After they get clean, they're, they're parked and then they'll be ready for service in the morning. Chronicle, Pittsburgh After Dark, continues after this. A movie going tradition being kept alive after dark in Pittsburgh. We visit two local drive-ins to show how they have stayed alive and even thrived for generations. But this is what they were printed on. If you've been to the movies in recent years, you've probably seen some changes. For one, film is a thing of the past. This is what the movies come on. But in Moon Township, one after dark movie going tradition continues. For Allegheny County, it's us. At the dependable drive-in, moviegoers get to see the latest movies on the big screen. 
even in the cold winter months. There's a lot of experiences you can't get in an indoor theater. You're not going to cuddle up with a blanket. You're not going to see snow. The drive in opened in 1950 and for most of its run has been owned by the Jay Gloss family. The business is open year round, serving regular customers. I'd rather come here than the indoor movie theater. And families keep their own traditions alive. I remember one off the top of my head from Mississippi. They used to live here, they had family here, and every time they come back to visit their family, they come to the drive-in with them. Even when the temperature drops, some customers keep showing up. There's some people that just like the experience and like being outside. Um, believe it or not, I've seen nights here where it's 10 degrees and there are still a couple people sitting outside on chairs. An, an added benefit of the winter, you know, you come here with your date, you're cuddling under a blanket, you know, it's cold in the car. People like that intimacy, I guess. More than 50 miles away in Parks Township, Armstrong County, Chronicle pays a visit to the Riverside Drive-In. The nostalgics when you play their older movies, uh, the first run stuff for the kids and the families, they, they come out, it's a great night out, it introduces a new generation. That drive-in is also the only one in its county and one that fought to survive during the COVID-19 pandemic. We had church services here Easter weekend for COVID. Um, a couple of high school graduations were, were held here and the kids all said they would wish they could do that again. COVID was basically uh, mostly retro movies. We did run seven nights a week and we flipped them twice a week. For the folks at both Riverside and Dependable, the mission seems to be the same. Great movies under the stars, bringing families together and keeping memories alive. It's kind of like a mecca for people. People never forget the drive. Next on Chronicle, a different kind of date night. There's no children. It's a little bit calmer. <laughs> How science after dark brings grown-ups together in an unexpected setting. It's a different kind of date night. The Science Center on the North Shore offers couples and even folks who just want a fun night out with friends a chance to experience all of the fun of the building without any kids around. Ashley Doherty tells us more about Science After Dark. There's no children. It's a little bit calmer. <laughs> the Science Center on Pittsburgh's North Shore may be known as a family friendly spot, but several evenings a year, the building becomes an adult only venue. It's a 21 plus night here at the Science Center, so we open our doors for an adult only crowd where they can explore a special theme, uh, walk around the Science Center with a drink and sort of relive the uh, you know, old high school field trip they may have had here, but uh, this time through a grown up lens. Science After Hours offers adults ages 21 and over a chance to experience the Science Center in a new way. And in early January, they were hosting Astronomy Night. We have shows in the Buell Planetarium. We've got our new Mars, the next giant leap exhibit. So anything you might think about under the stars, you can explore it here tonight. Speaking of those shows in the planetarium. Uh, it's just very intrusive. It's very quick and it comes at you, but it's a lot of fun. Visitors say the recent upgrades, including the addition of true 8K projection, have created an immersive experience like never before. It was a great experience uh, all around. It was just really, really interesting to actually expand yourself and go outside of, uh, of everything. But like so much in the early part of this decade, the 21 and overnights had come to a halt during the pandemic. Whenever the uh, COVID-19 pandemic first hit, obviously a lot of our programs uh, got put on pause and so about a year after that, we started bringing some adult programs back. We opened it up for anyone 18 and over. We had really limited numbers of tickets. Uh, and we've been very happy to see that folks have responded to that and started coming back to these programs. And now the crowd at the Science Center on these nights reaches as many as a thousand. And the great thing about it is that doesn't feel like a lot. We have a lot of room here. No one's going to be crowded. And for some couples, a night at the Science Center can offer a little bit of chemistry. We're just looking to explore Pittsburgh and we both like science, so we wanted to find something new to do. I would strongly <laughs> recommend it. It works great for a couple like us. While for other adults, it's an opportunity to see a place from their youth in a whole new light. Coming here just as an adult, being able to play with all of the things, not having to worry about being in the kids' way 
when you really want to play with the stuff too and learn from it. And having talks that come in is just amazing. Next on Chronicle. Everybody loves what they do here. Spending the overnight hours getting ready for the next morning. Pretty much it's built for us. If, if you're more than made donuts, you pretty much know. The team working all night long to make sure your breakfast is hot and fresh. That's ahead on Chronicle. As we know, most people eat breakfast in the morning, lunch in the afternoon, and dinner in the evening. And we said most, but not everyone. Whether for work or for play, some people don't even sit down to eat until after midnight, which can make finding good food a difficult task. But as Sheldon Ingram shows us, that's not the case in Pittsburgh. Businesses closed as early as 5 p.m. or as late as 10 p.m. When those places shut down, Others light up, especially on the south side. Posted business hours until the wee hours of the morning. And this place is the go-to in the 1300 block of Carson Street. Best pizza in town. It's the best, best pizza, pizza in town. town. This is Sal's. <laughs> best pizza in town. We're in south side, baby. Come on. <laughs> Gritty late night eats. Nothing fancy. Just a countertop a bunch of pizza pies, and raw, unapologetic appetites Is that a margarita? of the hungry nightclub crowd. Really? Freshman year of undergrad, we started going here. We're in law school now, we Why still come like here. Why do coming here? Because it stays open so late, or the pizza's that good? Both. Both. Down the street, La Bodega Taqueria is flipping and folding tacos until 3 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. And mad chicken serving it hot until 3 a.m. And then, Cambodian Kitchen is smoking up the corner of 17th and Carson until 3 a.m. This is Dan McSwiggin and his wife, Mern. Some call them the best at feeding the late night crowds. They tell us how they got started. Yeah, chicken's really good. Over food, of course. Well, you guys started your business out of a food truck? Yes. Yes, sir. Where was that? We parked it next to, uh, on the lot, next to what was then Nick's Fat City. They just followed the nightclub scene with the food truck from 1992 until 2003, and then their restaurant opened in 2006. And people said, you should stay open until the bars close. You'll do really well. And so... This is what people told you in the street. Yeah, yeah. You can eat in... <laughs> Thank you. ...or take out. Um, Who's coming in here at that late, that late hour after midnight? All kind of people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people some inebriated, night. some sober. Yeah. Some, you know, they get out of the bar. And yeah, yeah, out. yeah. After all that drinking, they're ready to eat some mm -hmm. food. Exactly. Right. I've been coming here since, like, 2010, when I first moved up to Mount Washington. Excuse me. We used to come down here as a, a young buck to the south side. It's kind of cool that they stay open at like 4.30 in the morning. Isn't yeah, it? definitely a good business model because their customers are mostly here from, I'd say, I'd say 1 to 3 in the morning because that's when you need food. It's never too late to eat on the south side. We've been showing you so many Pittsburghers who work long hours overnight, getting you ready for the day ahead. And this edition of Chronicle wouldn't be complete without a look at some of the people who spend most of the overnight hours preparing for the most important meal of the day. Breakfast. Take a look. Is that dough still looking a little high? Eh, it, it's not for everybody, but we're all night guys and night girls here, you know, the whole crew. It has been a tradition for more than 85 years, Orem's Donut Shop in Beaver Falls. Everybody loves what they do here. And like so many donut shops, workers at Orem spent the overnight hours preparing for treats that you'll be grabbing first thing in the morning. Oh, well, the regular night, we might do a you know, nice thousand or so. But you get into the busy weekend nights, I couldn't really tell you. The crew in the kitchen keeping up with demand. I'm the production manager, so from beginning to the end, I'm pretty much in charge of running the dough, mixing the dough, making icings, making sure the donut's quality is perfect so we can keep our tradition going since it's almost 85 years now. We're pretty popular in the Pittsburgh area, so we could get pretty busy at times. We like to keep a steady pace if we can, but you know, at the end of the day, pretty good. And they're also working to keep up with the competition. You put in the skill set and keep doing better to stay ahead of the curve because baking can be tough. So you always have to do what you can to stay on top of things. You know? But at the end of the day, you know, six days a week I'm here and do whatever I can to make sure we're top quality. 
This Beaver County staple draws in people who want to try Orem's Donuts for the first time or return with them after a homecoming. People will set up trips just to come for donuts. The main thing is if you leave the area, you want to come back to get your donuts. So that's another thing for holidays. You come to see your family, you're leaving with donuts. Guaranteed. And we couldn't leave without asking about an Orem's classic, those famous cinnamon rolls. We have our own thing that nobody has, a special recipe you know, since 1938. So you know, there's no other taste. Great cinnamon or fluffy. You know, some people like a little crisp on them. You know, they, they're, they're traditional. And there's another team that works hard all night long to get you ready to start your day. Ryan and I and everyone else on Pittsburgh's Action News 4. Join us weekday mornings starting at 430 to find out everything that happened in Pittsburgh overnight and after dark. From everyone here at Chronicle, thank you for watching.